So <clears throat> basically, I mean, the discussion that we just had about code reviews, I'm hoping that we can have a similar one about this just because uh, where this whole uh, presentation, I guess, comes from was uh, a few months ago we did a API meetup where we all got together and we broke out into separate groups and everybody hacked on the notes API and came back together and kind of said, hey, this is these are our findings. Um, Um, and uh, I thought that was pretty cool. Um, and then I'm starting a new project where I had to write an API, and I decided, you know what, I'm going to start over as if I don't know anything and see where I land, right? And it was a pretty interesting journey for me. And then we got to talking to Kyle and the Health Pro guys about where they landed. Um, talked just a little bit about where Lesson we landed. Um, and it was really interesting. We're all trying to solve a very similar problem but we landed in different places. So I feel like it might be good if uh, we kind of run through um, a bit about what were the decision points, um, why we chose one thing over another, uh, and then really just kind of have an open discussion about it at the end. So, uh, with that being said, I'll jump right into it. We were talking on our flow doc um, a little bit about this, and we're like, okay, well, how best do we organize this? So we came up with uh, seven questions um, that we feel like could uh, encapsulate the decision process, uh, the decision tree that we went through. So uh, why an API anyway? Um, oftentimes when you, you hear about, oh, I went with Grape or I went with whatever, you don't know where that decision tree started. So that's why I wanted to kind of talk about that a little bit. So for the project that I am working on, as two developers, it's an on-the-side thing. We want to come up with a good way to separate the work out where he's doing one thing, I'm doing another. We don't have to uh, collide. We know we want to go pretty fast. Um, so that's... So we were thinking about it, and we're like, okay, well, let's split up the work with one of us doing the back end, that's me, and the other guy doing uh, the front end. So um, we're like, well, should we use uh, React or Bootstrap, or what, what should we use there? Um, React, and this is uh, not in JS, but uh, React is the new hot thing on the streets these days. Um, from what we understand, it has a, a lot of a lot of speed um, benefits to it. We want to get some experience with the new technology, uh, but at the end of the day, there's this guy that used to really really hate JavaScript that we kept hearing like, oh my God, I love JavaScript now. So um, when we heard about this guy <laughs> uh, loving JavaScript and some of these tweets. <laughs> like, so that one, that one in the upper left, that's not me. The up, one in the upper left uh, corner, though, was my very first tweet ever. <laughs> <laughs> and so with as much JavaScript gay as this guy has, we're like, okay, well, if he loves, Re uh, loves JavaScript now and he's doing React, let's give it a shot. Anyway, um, <laughs> So the first question I ask, I'm lazy, I'm like, is there anything that will do all of the things for me? Uh, what are some of the things that we have to think about? Um, the contract convention, uh, so how do we set up, where do we put, how do we handle arrays, how do we handle uh, error codes, how do we handle all that stuff? Um, you know, most people are doing the HTTP verbs and puts and patches and whatnot. Um, but we got to come up with the standards. So that's something we have to talk about that he has to understand. I have to deliver on uh, some more advanced things like the pagination, the, uh, the model querying, um, where you can look at the API and based on what's in the content, you can navigate through the API in a programmatic way. Uh, versioning. So is there anything out there that can handle all this shit for me? Um, well, the answer that I came up with, and, was no, no, there's nothing that will do it all for me, so I have to pick out some things that 
I really want to, uh, I really want standardization on it. And I felt like the top thing that would uh, cause us to slow down was the bike check, right? So how do we do this? So the, the API should look this way. You should have a data node at the root level. Don't worry about that. Put the uh, name of the class so you'll have people as the root node and uh, an array of people underneath that, or a person as the root node. Oh no, put data. All that bike shedding that, I know if you've ever built an API from from scratch where you didn't follow any convention or anything like that, which I've done a few times, right? Um, these are conversations that are just really frustrating for me because it doesn't get to the value of the thing that we're trying to do. I'm about trying to figure out how to get the thing to market, how to help build the thing, ship it, get it out the door. So how can I get rid of the bike shedding stuff and focus on what matters? And so I started looking into a, a couple of the, the different conventions out there. And, um, it's really like opened up my eyes because I didn't realize that these things existed before this point. So JSON Howl, I guess, has been around for quite a while now. Um, those of you who, who know what JSON Howl is. And it basically just gives you a, a framework to on where you put certain things, where you put the links to the other objects. So uh, within the API, send out a get request to get the person object, right? You're going to have sub nodes in there. You're building a shopping cart. You might have person and in your cart, right? How do you, how does that all play? How does it all work? Um, well, Jason Howe was the first in the community to try to uh, standardize that. Well, JSON API, um, those of you who have heard of Yahoo Cats, uh, there's a, a lot of other really intelligent people in there, but Yahoo Cats is one of the core contributors to Rails. And um, uh, him and a few other people, they came up with JSON API, uh, which was basically JSON how, but uh, in their words, better, right? They, it, it, JSON how doesn't deal with, uh, JSON how deals with just how the data comes out with get requests. It doesn't deal with how you should do your put requests and the changes and your patches and things of that nature. So they felt like, you know what, we need to come up with something that's a little more all inclusive. Uh, so they came up with JSON API, which um, this spec is, uh, it's not a light read, but it's really easy to read, it's a quick read. Um, and in my decision tree, I, want, I, I just fell in love with it. You know, when I saw it, I'm like, yes, this is absolutely what we're using. It handles errors, it, it does all of that. And just um, probably two months ago, went to version 1.0. I mean, they were doing a lot of thrashing about for the last uh, year or so, but it just went to 1.0. So, and their uh, vow is that they won't only add, they won't modify any of the things, so they'll always be backwards compatible. We'll see if they can actually do that, but that's their vow. So um, so then, okay, so I have the convention set up. Do we use Rails? Do we not uh, use Rails? Um, I know that you guys ended up with great, right? So I won't discuss my decision tree around that, but for us, and Miles, I was talking to Miles the other day, and uh, now, again, I'll let you talk about it, but he has a really interesting way to use Break with Rails together. Um, but I didn't know about that at the time, so I'm like, look, we, we know that this entire app is not going to be a single page app. We're going to have some uh, regular pages to stand up, so we're just going to use regular Rails, and uh, now we have to figure out a way to, uh, is there something out there that will implement this JSON API stuff for us, right? Um, so we know we have a person object and a card object and all the rest of that, but how, where do we put all of those things? And I said that, that Kyle wasn't here because we had an interesting, interesting discussion about this. Oftentimes, um, when I'm thinking about presentation with MVC, I'm thinking about presentation, it has to be in the template, right? The, uh, the all of what attributes are there, how they're all set up, all of that stuff has to be in the template. This is just the way that I thought. It was dogmatic, it was just, uh, there's no other way. And so I'm definitely using Ravel, I'm definitely using JBuilder, something like that, right? Well, I started researching and uh, Active Model Serializers was the first one that I ran into and they just don't do that. 
they put all of their uh, definition of how the API should look from a rendering perspective in regular Ruby classes. And I thought, okay, this feels a little wrong. I feel a little dirty by doing this, but um, I love the fact that they have the adaptive pattern. So if we decide to uh, JSON API is crap, we want to go to uh, JSON HAL or some other, we want to write our own adapter, we could do that. I love the flexibility there. Um, but honestly, I just, uh, it wasn't as mature as I wanted it to be to, to use it. There wasn't enough out there for for what I needed. Um, so I started uh, looking into Roar. I actually went to uh, the NDRB Flowdoc and asked this question to everybody in here. If you're not in Flowdoc, jump in there. It was extremely valuable, at least for me. We had a really good discussion. That's when I realized these guys were using Roar. Um, and I had heard about the Trailblazer stuff. Uh, a little bit, which, uh, quick tangent, Trailblazer, if you've never heard of it, um, basically what they're trying to do is they're saying that there's not, I don't want to say there's not enough abstraction in Rails, but they feel like things should be organized better. It's a concept-oriented uh, architecture. I have a lot of really cool gems that are, that are really mature. Me, Trailblazer is trying to just take them all and package them up into one kind of like meta framework on top of Rails. Um, I think this is crazy interesting, and if anybody has experience with it, I would love for you to give a talk on that thing. Uh, and I told a couple people that I was going to do this. We, we had some issues coming up with what topics to talk about during NDRB. Um, so if you have a computer out in front of you, Please go to ndrbuservoice.com, put something in there, go on the stuff that's out there. We need help trying to come up with the ideas, right? Because uh, we thought this was a pretty good idea. I would love somebody to be able to talk on Trailblazer, but a quick plug for the future of NDRB. Uh, this is a joint effort. This is all of us, right? So go out there. If there's something that you find interesting or something that's new, go out there, let us know. Um, and we'll see if we can spark a conversation and maybe have somebody uh, spend some time and give a presentation uh, during one of these things. So anyway, that's my quick uh, plug for uh, Indy or RV inside of Indy RV. Um, so I was trying out Roar, and to be honest with you, the only reason why we didn't go with Roar was because they weren't their latest adapter uh, wasn't up to date with the latest revisions of the JSON API specification. Uh, in the latest version, you have to have a data group node. Um, but older specifications, if you wanted to list of people, the root node would be people, right? So now the root node is data, and inside of that JSON object, you have a type, and it's called people, right? So uh, the implementation of the Roar gem, their JSON API adapter, uh, still use the old version. I didn't want to use the old version. I love open source. I should have jumped in there and, and did a pull request and thing myself, but I was lazy and I was going to see if somebody else was doing the latest and rarest stuff. One of the uh, JSON API um, co write co authors uh, authored this other gem called JSON API Resources. And uh, what? No, I didn't read it. Um, and uh, it's a gem that does, it doesn't use the adaptive pattern, which I didn't like because I like the flexibility of being able to switch from one to another or write my own adapter. Um, it just does JSON API, but because it's so opinionated and so focused on JSON API, it's always up to date um, and it does a lot of things for you. So they give you, uh, they have, um, features where you can put things in your routes file, and they'll set up the routes for you. Uh, they have a whole resources layer that's super clean. It doesn't have any of the other concepts in it. Right? It's only for JSON API, which is a little dangerous if we ever want to switch away from JSON API, but I'm like, you know what? We're going to ride or die with this thing. Uh, so JSON API resources is, um, is what we chose. Uh, one of the things that I look for in any gym that I use is how many watchers, how many issues, how active it is. 
Uh, and this one is extremely active. The, the guy who was the co-author of JSON API and also the author of JSON API resources, Jim, uh, is constantly in there multiple days out of the week to uh, fix things or have discussions. So um, though not nearly as mature as Roar or even active model serializers, um, it gave gave me a lot out of the out of the box that I could just run. Um, so the last thing is, you know, just to retrospect on it a little bit. Um, like I said, the JSON API specification is awesome. I love to debate, as anybody who's worked with me knows, but that can get in the way of productivity, right? So if there's one area where I can have people smarter than me who've made some decisions about how things should interact, um, that doesn't have a direct impact on the features that we're building, you know, those are things that I want to utilize. So JSON API spec is awesome. Um, using classes instead of templates, uh, this is something that I never even thought about, right? So this is, uh, again, uh, I was having a conversation with Kyle, which is, uh, tape on it because he was like, yeah, I liked that. I want it. That seemed so foreign to me when I first saw it. So um, that's something nice that I learned throughout this uh, process. And then just open source in general. Like I said, I, I wish uh, I would have been a good steward of the community and uh, did a pull request on the Roar JSON API adapter. Besides, go with JSON API resources. I have every intention on helping them at some point, but um, but open source just in general is awesome. I don't have to say that to this room because most of us are Rails developers and we've been Rails developers for a while, but if you come from a, a language where that isn't a part of the core culture, it's so powerful. So, and it just reinforced that going through this whole system. Um, and I think that is it for uh, <clears throat> my decision tree, and again, I wanted to see if Miles, I know you guys ended up with something different, and Steve, uh, to kind of give their uh, yeah. little history. So Kyle's have been uh, forever, but um, actually, for a little bit here. So at Health Pro, first of all, you should know that um, there's some baggage that, that's, that ultimately led to uh, some of the decisions we made, or at least influenced them. Um, we, Kyle converted a Ruby on Rails application with an Angular front end into a Ruby on Rails with an Angular front end, and then from there we have moved away from the Angular, which was um, not necessarily Angular's fault, but it was some somewhat questionable code decisions made in the Angular. We have moved from Angular to React. Um, so by the time I came on board, I had already done all of the work to convert from Ruby on Rails to Ruby on Rails. Um, and we were kind of doing some, like paying some technical debt uh, on the Rails side from an API perspective, um, as well as starting to convert things to React. Uh, but while paying that, that technical debt and trying to refactor some of the API stuff, um, we also needed to make sure it continued to work. Like we couldn't, obviously we couldn't break the Angular front end Quite frankly, we weren't interested in um, refactoring the Angular stuff because we were wanting to get rid of it anyway. So that would be kind of a waste of our, our resources. Um, so we messed with several different things. I'm pretty sure Probably we tried all that we could find that was out there. Yeah. Um, there were, I mean, there were performance concerns uh, that came in because there were some pages that loaded it wasn't so much that they loaded a ton of, um, like a large number of records, but but each record then had several, like essentially sub records and related um, records that were being pulled in as well. I mean, so ultimately there was a you know uh, flattened out a very large number of records. Uh, so things like JBuilder performed very poorly, um, and we 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 got to a point. Let me tell you a fun story about what I did one day. <laughs> one day, we spent the day finding out that if you want writing just SQL that is PostgreSQL compatible, you can get JSON. Um, and it is so fast. It is also unreadable by human beings. 
probably unreadable by any advanced race as well. Uh, but it was, it took 40 milliseconds where um, most of our uh, like Ruby code was taking 10 to 20 times that. Uh, I think it started off like unoptimized. The reason we solved this problem at all is it was taking like five seconds to render the page, maybe even longer. Um, we tried to move to like JBuilder and some of those. That got us down to about, I don't know, it was like one second. And I mean, our, like, our performance needs are pretty low, but it was sort of a like, it was still really, like the Rails code at that point still wasn't even that great. So I was like, okay, thought experiment. What would it take to do it in your SQL? So a few things, if you do decide to go through SQL route, they're interesting. Mm -hmm. So there's a ton of these like JSON aggregation functions in Postgres now that are pretty cool. So there's like a RAG, JSON AG. Um, so yeah, you can actually do some JSON manipulation. Now Postgres also has you know, JSON as a valid column type. So you can actually store JSON in records, which is kind of interesting. Um, the other thing that we use a decent amount is what's called uh, it's common table expressions or like width expressions. So basically, before like you were writing a big Postgres query, you would have these like nested subqueries all over the place, um, and you like it's really hard to read all of that. But with common table expressions, you can extract those nested subqueries out to the top or wherever else you want to do with this subquery as this name, and then you can just drop that name into your other Postgres. Um, so even if you don't decide to go the full Postgres route, you want to do a common table expression, this is pretty cool. Um, yeah, so, so yeah, it was basically the trade-off between 40 milliseconds and 40 lines of code uh, was kind of what we were evaluating, I think. Yeah, I think we'll, yeah. Can I kick in on that piece? Sure. Because I went through a very similar thing not too long ago. Uh, I was using, in this case, ActiveBuzz for the and uh, I had a request that would take three seconds to satisfy because the data was going to be employed together. So, and, uh, and I took that down to 50 milliseconds by just throwing in a cache because in, in Acrobat Serialize, which is not with pull request, they accept it. Uh, <laughs> it integrates with Rails cache uh, so that you can just, it'll take the raw JSON string and just shove it in Redis or whatever and then just pull that out. In our case, the data didn't change that frequently, but I expired it every three hours or whatever, and, and that took it from three seconds down to like 50 milliseconds as well. Cool. And no SQL, so none. I did not have to write any SQL. <laughs> <laughs> so we we did end up trying active model serializers. If I remember correctly, our only real problem with active model serializers is monkey patches Rails to in monkey patches Rails to force, if I remember correctly, to force that there is a root node of the name of the model. And that broke our quote unquote legacy Angular stuff as much as Angular 1.3 can be legacy today. Um, and it made me shake my fist at active model serializers for monkey patching rails. And so we went to the war. At least that's how I remember it. Huh? It depends on the adapter you use. One adapter you can't unplug it, the other one you can't. Okay. Active model serializers in general. So it's awesome that you're talking about this because today we are researching and going through all this stuff for our current project, but we're also versioning the API, so we're nice. compatible supporting it as we yeah. move from a nested structure to a flattened structure. Mm -hmm. um, and active model serializers is a bit of a hot mess. I would definitely recommend, if you can avoid it, please do. It. They, the project itself is a bit of a hot mess. The way they're managing the versions and the releases and all that stuff, it's just, it'll break on you really quickly across point releases, or like patch releases, I mean. And one one branch supports this feature, but the, the next version up doesn't, and then the one after that does again, and it's it's kind of a, it's a little bit, you gotta, you gotta be okay with that if you're gonna use the project. Right. Um, Just from experience. That <laughs> so I, I haven't had, I probably haven't used Roar as much as you have Kyle. Uh, I do like, Kyle said, he thinks he likes Roar, he just doesn't trust it. <laughs> that's about where I'm at right now. So I'm like, on a scale of one to five, I'm like a three out of five. I don't know if that's like the peak for JSON generation libraries in Ruby right now. <laughs> that's like what we aspire to. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean like there's there's enough places where I've had to kind of do some gymnastics to generate the kind of SQL or the kind of JSON that I want to generate that 
you know, I, I'm not in love with it, but I'm not ready to break up with it quite yet. Um, I will say as well, um, if I can hide paperwork for a moment, um, we've at least we've been kind of looking at so our you know our front end is in React, um, so we've been looking into like the GraphQL and uh, React Relay stuff that's been coming out in the last month or two. Um, there's some pretty interesting stuff in there, specifically around versioning APIs, although it's kind of an all-in um, GraphQL and like building an endpoint for that, but. Um, Basically, every component of your application has kind of a declarative dependency on what data it needs. Um, and then you define a schema, and it kind of automatically, you know, you basically define some mutators and accessors, and it kind of serializes and deserializes your data across the front end and back end, almost like a you know, meteor type thing, except there's security and stuff. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, it, they just released technical previews for both of those, but we're going to be looking at so, you know, this doesn't mean to ask, so no one cares. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, that might be something interesting to talk about because I'd, I'd be interested to see if there's a, a model where that applies to Rails at all. So, anyway, we'll keep, we'll keep you posted on GraphQL. I'm going to attempt to provide a transition to, to you, Steve. Sure. Um, so, on, an, on another clients project that is very small and has It has very, very constrained API needs at the moment. Um, there is a there's an iOS app that needs to get a little bit of data from the app and put a little bit of data in the app. Very little. Um, I went to it. Great because you can actually there's a there's a, a larger Rails app component, sort of an administration interface, and you can mount Grape within your Rails app, um, uh, and Grape gives you some versioning options kind of out of the box uh, and various other nice options uh, around like specifically um, like what data is required when someone is making an IPP, API request uh, and responding uh, with the correct error and all that sort of stuff. So that got me uh, for this small project this, that has a uh, Similarly sized budget uh, that got me moving very quick and got to where they need to be very quick. And I know you guys have less than use great quite a bit, is that right? That is correct. As well as active model services. Yes, and Rails. So we do the same thing. We've got our main Rails app that does all the things. Uh, but wanted to kind of add an API with some limited functionality. You can't do everything, but the important stuff. Uh, and so we use Grape. Uh, just mounted it. I, Rails engine maybe, or mounted it in the Rails file because it's a rack app, so it plays nicely with all Rails and everything. Um, I think the reasons we chose Grape were one, because I was on your team a couple months ago at Adobe, <laughs> and we built an API in like an hour and a half, which is pretty great. So we're like, all right, that sounds good for you know limited functionality. Just want to get it out and see if people use it. Um, and Grape did deliver. It was uh, really fast to develop with. Uh, it gives you a ton out of the box, so. Authentication, versioning, um, managing headers and things like that. Um, it, I have a sense that it's maybe a little too magic. Um, you know, we haven't. It's it's a young enough API. It's like two months old. Um, uh, so we haven't yet hit the point where we're like, oh, we need to do this one thing a different way that Greg wants you to. And so we haven't really felt the pain there yet. Uh, I'm assuming there will be some, but we'll see. Um, although we're starting to get there. Great also. Uh, sort of following the rack philosophy has uh, like a middleware stack. So if you need to do something to your API before requests come in or after they go out, you can just sort of build a little middleware that transforms um, something about the request. So it's it does a lot for you, but it seems at least, and we're just getting in there now, but if you need to do your own stuff, it will sort of get out of the way. Um, and then, yeah, I think we went with active model serializers. Uh, not sure why. I think it was maybe in, in the app already. Uh, Kyle, you might yeah. remember some of this. <laughs> uh, we loved it. We loved it. We've not yet hit the, uh, you know, been using it long enough, I think, that we try to update something and everything explodes. But I'm sure we'll get there and it'll be fun. Uh, but yeah, I mean, it's just uh, sort of um, 
like you said, Andrew, with like having just a Ruby class uh, instead of a template file, um, it just seems like it leads to less code. You just say like, this thing has these attributes and this association, and it sort of magically builds your JSON response. Um, but again, sort of like uh, with great, it's the kind of thing we haven't yet hit the point where we need to go really custom and override a lot yet. So maybe there's some pain there. But at least, you know, so the great um, active model serializers route let us build an API really fast. Um, it's pretty performant, as far as we can tell. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it was, it was what we wanted. We wanted something that was kind of, gives you a lot out of the box, you can stand up really quickly, and those two delivered for us. Man, this is how you even have an API. <laughs> you can't change how yeah. it's anything about it. It's, uh, it doesn't use an office shop, right? It's old enough that it can be short enough that it's I don't know how exactly it's all put together. It's, it's a Sinatra app that lives inside the same process that the Rails app. Um, but it gets routed through the Rails Okay, right, right. cool. There's a lot of custom stuff to the authentication and delivery. You, um, when you write an API endpoint, um, you end up creating a hash and we're going to write a that's just return to the phone and we got to write one of the phones. That's kind of that the last thing you said is kind of what I'm doing in this um, this tiny thing for this small client, but I didn't mention it because it feels somewhat wrong to me. <laughs> but great great sound that works into me and then using just a really simple You probably get into reviews. Yeah. Yeah. I have a question. Is there any technology um, that somebody is like super excited about uh, API related that hasn't been brought up yet? Didn't. So Amazon just released a new service, right? That's for APIs, <laughs> and that I just saw like a blurb on it, and apparently it's. Uh, say what it's called. Lambda. There's land is like the odd max scaling thing. This is yet another thing. <laughs> it was called API Gateway. API Gateway, I and it was the term. From what I read about it, is it seemed like you could build a whole API based just on Lambda functions. So you could write yes. a like a node or Java code right. and have it as a Lambda function, and then and it call to this API Gateway magic thing where yeah. you know like this request is going to get routed to this little snippet, and I'm going to run it on not a real computer. And it had a version. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it had, it had a version facility, too, which is one of the bigger other books about handling APIs. And I gave it a cursor. It's containing it on market space. I'm pretty sure it's called API. Yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> I think, too, you could do some things that uh, you didn't have to write everything as Lambda. It's like if you had a, an old API that you could hook it up to kind of like reverse proxy whatever garbage you had behind it and then you know, use a new um, you write new things in Lambda or whatever else you want to do and send it with them and then you can come up with a unified API if you had you want to use okay. why, why compromise? Right, yeah. yeah. That could be a good thing at least. You can do that in the red chip. Like the Lambda and all that was that work for analytics. I did work through this code school example of just using Rails for an API. I didn't think it was that bad. I never had to actually apply it. But it was just, it was just Rails to routes. And you got versions and you just wasn't that bad. Um, what do you know about Rails API? Uh, it's coming out on Rails 5. Uh, yeah. Where exactly does it sit in terms of some of the comments? It's just a Rails version with a bunch of gems written down, right? You know, so it's only, not only specific to APIs. So, and then you can. Eventually, you end up can build it right back to Rails again if you want to. We've done so, this magical journey. Look where we've been. Yeah, yeah. I was like, why don't you just bail on back to Rails? I, I don't know. So it was like a separate, like a project, somewhat 
on rails, or it's not quite probably the correct term. Is it similar to Trailblazer, where it's like kind of like an alternate collection? It's like the, the <coughs> that's kind of like Minecraft, Minecraft, Rails, yeah. APIs, yeah. or Rails. Everything in it is Rails, but just with less. And I think it was yeah. even some either Rails core members or people like so the Rails community. So that's really just out like a lot of different components of Rails into their own set of things and just kind of like bundle those together in what we know of as Rails. They've just realized that they can commit some of those and have something that's more, more focused for safety. And David Steinmeier Hansen was kind of snarky about it for a while, but now it's now it's part of it's a way five. you can build Rails right. out of the box. I think it's basically a generator with Rails 5, yeah. so you say Rails new dash dash API and get all that stuff ripped out without having to like depend on the separate channel. Andrew, did your group play with it when we were doing the, and you were like, whatever, it's stupid. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we did start with it, and then you were like, oh, this is just Rails with everything ripped out, so we're not going to do it. Seems like Rails. So it seems like the bridge can be useful at least if they utilize like um, you know, similar framework or standards, right? And then you come up like you're talking about. Um, Your controllers API. look quite a bit different. I mean, the controller, like the Union Rails G controller, uh, I know they look significantly different. It's from the perspective of the There's no, um, it's just two JSON and all the things instead of uh, doing that. I will say, um, the, the great DSL, like, I don't know if you're familiar with the squint test, where you kind of push your computer back from you, you, you kind of squint at the code, just to, like, there's always a certain, like, cadence to an extent to, the, to, a, to a, a file whole Ruby code. Um, and if you were to do that, while looking at the, the way they typically, um, the example, like, great API stuff, you kind of be like, oh, that's terrible. But, like, everything's in there. It's a self-contained, like, you, you can, you, you know that endpoint that you're looking at and everything it does and everything it requires. Um, and I, I, at the moment, I'm fine with that. So, you, you mentioned action table. I'm kind of off oh, yeah. earlier. Is anybody actually using, like, websites Some for APIs? Instead of media, <laughs> using non, like highly non rest point planks. I know you were. No, we had very rest No, you were talking about it in the context of mobile mobile you were working on a long time ago, like doing very like client specific endpoints. Oh uh, yeah, there's there's a school of thought that's like if you're making an API for general consumption, but if you are GitHub, right? You have to make endpoints for every resource because you're not really sure how people are going to combine. But if you're making the API for a mobile app, like you can make it so that every screen in your mobile app is one API call, and you get resources combined, and that makes it maybe easier to make your mobile app. So that that breaks maybe from the pure rest of every entity has to, you know, you have to call slash people to get the person, and then slash courses to get courses, and then glue them together. I'm currently a huge fan of that idea based on my struggles coding with it. So. I call that a web API or an HTTP API. I stay away from the word REST for that just to avoid the discrepancies. It's really not REST, it's just JSON over HTTP, you know, which works right. fantastic in like 90% of the cases, especially yeah. when you, if you own all the pieces involved or at least you know, own the lifecycle line. And we're working on a mobile app where it gets all being published internally, so it's not in the App Store, uh, except Google and might be, in, no, it's not even a place where they all sell it locally. And so we know who's using what, and we can, we put built into the API on the client side right from the start. If you get back a certain HTTP response, that indicates that the API is deprecated and you haven't updated like you were supposed to. And so we just have that handle a special case and so show a certain message and be like, you can't use this app. Now, because in that case, we can then support basically two versions of the API at any given time while we let everybody upgrade. And then after they're, most of them are upgraded, we can just get everybody else. <laughs> but in that case, you know, the, the, some of the benefits of REST and the discoverability are more work than it's worth. I call that a web API. I have another. So, I have a side project that um, uses a pusher service for doing sockets. <coughs> and 
if you're a Rails developer and you're saying, man, I want to mess around with sockets and web sockets and, and Rails 5 haven't showed up, what they're going to give us. One thing uh, to consider is instead of trying to set up sockets talking to Pusher and then, and then some other, whatever your socket server is, using sockets back to your client, you can go old school and have your actually your client just post back to your regular plain old Rails app, and then and then you go then you post over to Pusher, and then Pusher um, through the client can go back to your client through an actual socket. So that I, I, I got tripped up on my side project trying to get it to go both ways. It's like I went most of the way to traditional Rails, and then only pushed back with the socket and got me off the ground. I don't know if it'll end up that way. Questions, concerns? Uh, I'll say one more thing about Roar really quickly, which is um, they're actually, so Roar is built on top of another gem that I think is part of the trail that's our architecture called Representable. So I found sometimes that when I'm working with Roar, I also have to look at documentation for Representable. Um, that's reprehensible. Yes, that sounds like a bug, not a feature. But, <laughs> but, um, so if you do decide to look at Roar, you may also need to track that Representable. It's by the same guy. One more thing I want to mention before we end the way to that, but just so I'm triggered, was uh, earlier we, you were talking about the different serializers, but also um, uh, well, when you're, one, thing, one important thing to consider when you're considering a serializer library or something like that is versioning, because there's uh, gems and tools for helping you to version your API from a HTTP perspective and your controllers and like what everything is doing. But a lot of times, that one thing I'm finding now is where that breaks down is the serializers. Do they support versioning the serializer? Because usually, if you're making a breaking API change, it's going to usually involve some data format representation changes that are significant. And that's one where, like with active model serializers, another thing we're trying to, and we just haven't gone down the full path yet, but trying to figure out, okay, so now we have a whole new version of our API. How do we tell that one use this representation and this one use this representation? What libraries best support that? That's, as you're thinking through, you know which gem you would like to le leverage, or which two JSON hash GitHub likes to reference. Uh, either way, the, that's an important thing to talk about. So I'll bounce on that really quickly. One of the reasons that I prefer the class-based approach, like the table-based approach, is I can kind of use other Ruby tricks to, like, you know, I can use my standard Ruby tricks for stuff like that. So like in theory, in that case, you could look at the version of the API and extend your representer with a particular version of the serializer and just override the methods that have changed or something. So like, you know, in that case, you don't have to patch the original gem or something. You can just use Ruby to do Ruby things. And maybe the gem has a tool that makes it easier and you can use the DSL, but that's one thing that's nice about Ruby classes and serializers. I said I know you said things, but I heard Ruby Pains. <laughs> I just pictured like picture of Kyle smiling like this and so being like, what do you think about Kyle? He's like, Ruby Pains. <laughs> <laughs> I can make that image out of it. I'm not one to pick to do my own home with pretty good Photoshop. One of your Photoshop's in it <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone, for coming to the ERB. I think that's a wrap. Feel free to drink some more beer and eat all the pizza out there and hang out and talk. And we'll see you next month. Okay. Thank you.